All right, let's dive into the term structure of interest rates. You know, I know this is a big one for the CFA level two folks, and frankly, it's crucial for anyone who wants to really understand how fixed income works or really just markets in general. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's the backbone of so much of what we do in finance. I mean, think about it, valuing bonds, managing interest rate risk, even predicting where the economy is headed. It's like that secret code you need to crack to really get ahead in the game, right? Absolutely. Whether you're managing a portfolio or just trying to understand the news, this stuff is key. So where do we even start with something as complex as the term structure? Well, I think the best place to start is with the basics, the building blocks, and that would be spot rates. Okay, spot rates, remind me, what are those again? So think of them as like the pure interest rates you'd get for different periods of time, you know? Like if you lend money for a year, the one-year spot rate is what you'd expect to earn. Same for two years, five years, you name it. Okay, that makes sense. So if I see that the two-year spot rate is higher than the one-year spot rate, what does that tell me? Does it mean the market thinks rates are going up? Well, it could, but it's not always that straightforward. It could also just mean that investors want a bigger reward for tying up their money for longer, you know, regardless of what they think rates will do. There's a lot that goes into shaping that yield curve. Ah, yes, the yield curve. That's how we visualize all those different spot rates, right? Showing how yields change as maturity gets longer. Exactly. And those curves can take on all sorts of shapes, right? Upward sloping, downward sloping, sometimes even flat or with a hump in the middle. Each one tells us a different story about what the market's thinking. Now, how do forward rates fit into all of this? There are those interest rates for future periods, right? But how are they linked to the spot rates we see today? Well, you can actually think of those forward rates as like implied by the spot rates that already exist. So let's say, you know, the one-year spot rate and the two-year spot rate, right? Well, from that, you can figure out what the one-year forward rate one year from now would have to be. Hold on. So the market is already baking in its expectations about future rates. That's the idea, right? It assumes you can't just make risk-free profits by playing games with different rates. That's the no arbitrage principle. And that principle actually connects those spot rates and forward rates in a really predictable way. Wow, that's a powerful concept. So even if I can't see those future spot rates, I can get some clues from today's forward rates about what the market thinks is coming. Absolutely. And that's why this whole term structure is so useful. It's like a window into the future, or at least what the market thinks the future holds. Now, I can't talk about interest rates without bringing up yield to maturity, or YTM. That's like one of the first things you learn about when you start studying bonds, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. It's the classic what's my return number, right? But there's a catch or a few catches, I should say. There always is, isn't there? Well, you know, YTM, it assumes you're going to hold that bond until it matures. It assumes every payment comes in right on time, no funny business, and that you reinvest those coupon payments at that same YTM rate. Which, let's be honest, almost never happens perfectly in real life. It's more of a theoretical thing than a guaranteed return. Exactly. You got it. And the relationship between YTM and the spot rates we talked about earlier, well, that can get a bit tricky. It all depends on what that yield curve looks like. Let's say it's upward sloping, for example. In that case, the YTM on a two-year bond, it's going to fall somewhere between the one-year spot rate and the two-year spot rate. So it's kind of like an average, but it's also affected by where those big cash flows land on the timeline, right? You got it. And honestly, this whole relationship between spot rates and YTM it's a must-know for anyone taking the CFA Level 2 exam. And not just for the exam, it's crucial for making good investment decisions in the real world, too. Speaking of the real world, I'm really curious about how those active bond managers, the pros, use all of this term structure knowledge to try and beat the market. I mean, it can't just be buy and hold, right? Oh, it gets much more interesting than that, for sure. One of their favorite tricks is this strategy called rolling down the yield curve. Imagine you buy a 10-year bond today, hold it for five years, and then sell it. Okay, so if rates stay the same, that 10-year bond basically becomes a five-year bond after five years, and it would be priced at a lower yield, right? Exactly. And you get to pocket that difference as a price gain. It all hinges on the idea that the forward curve, well, it doesn't always perfectly predict what those future spot rates will be. If you can get a read on those future rates better than the market, you could potentially find some opportunities to make some extra returns. It's like trying to outsmart the market by predicting the future. In a way, it is. To be a successful active bond manager, you need to have a view on where interest rates are heading and how that yield curve might shift. That's how you position your portfolio to take advantage of those changes. This is making me rethink bonds entirely. It's not just about holding on to them. It's about actively managing your exposure to different parts of that yield curve. You got it. It's all about being dynamic. And that brings us to another really important piece of the puzzle, the swap curve. Think of it like an alternative universe of interest rates, but these are derived from interest rate swaps. Okay, I'm with you on swaps. You know, two parties agreeing to exchange fixed and floating interest payments. 
But how does that create a whole other yield curve? Well, imagine you're a bank, right? And you've got a bunch of fixed rate liabilities on your books, things like CDs. Now you might want to turn those into floating rate liabilities to better align with your assets. So you'd enter into a swap where you're paying a fixed rate and receiving a floating rate, maybe based on something like SOFR. Exactly. And the fixed rate you pay in that swap, well, that's determined by the swap curve. It's basically the rate that makes the swap have a net present value of zero when you start it. So why are swap curves such a big deal? Well, for one, they can be a lot more liquid and reliable than government bond markets, especially in places where those bond markets aren't super active. And they also give you some really good insights into the creditworthiness of those financial institutions because, you know, those swap rates are affected by the perceived risk of the properties involved. So it's not just some theoretical thing. Swap curves are actually used by banks and investors to manage risk and hedge their bets. Absolutely. They're a core part of how finance works today. And if you understand that relationship between the swap curves and those government bond curves, you can get a much deeper understanding of credit risk in the market. This is all so fascinating. I mean, we've already covered so much. Spot rates, forward rates, yield to maturity, and now swap curves. It's like we're building a whole framework for understanding the fixed income market. And we're just getting started. There are so many other interesting spreads, theories, and models that build on these basic concepts. Ready to keep going. Oh, absolutely. Bring it on. I'm ready to go deeper. All right. So we were talking about swap curve, and I remember there being something about swap spreads, too. Yeah, right. You are. Swap spreads, they basically tell you the difference between the swap rate for a specific maturity and the yield on a government bond with the same maturity. Okay, so it's like a measure of how much extra yield you'd need to hold the swap instead of that super safe government bond. You got it. A wider swap spread usually means the market's a bit more nervous, sees more risk out there, and you know that information is gold when you're trying to value bonds. I could see how that'd be useful. Can you walk me through an example? Sure. Imagine you're looking at a corporate bond and trying to figure out if the price is right. You can look at the swap spread for that bond and then compare it to similar bonds. If the spread is wider, well, maybe the market's undervaluing that bond. Uh-huh. So swap spreads are like a shortcut to spotting potential bargains or at least figuring out relative value. That's the idea. It's just one piece of the puzzle, but it's a good one to have in your toolkit. And speaking of tools, isn't there a whole bunch of different spreads out there? I've heard of I spreads, Z spreads, even TED spreads. It's a lot to keep track of. Uh -huh. Yeah, the fixed income world loves its spreads. But, you know, they each tell us something different about what's happening in the market, about risk, about sentiment. Think of them like different lenses for looking at the market. Okay, so help me sort through some of them. What's an I spread all about? Well, the I spread or interpolated spread is just the difference between the yield on a bond and the swap rate for that same maturity. It's your basic go-to measure of credit risk for corporate bonds. Got it. So bigger spread equals more credit risk. Simple enough. Now those Z spreads, those always seemed a bit more complicated. Yeah, the Z spread or zero volatility spread, it's basically the extra yield a bond needs to offer on top of those risk-free rates to make up for its specific risks. Think of it like finding the perfect custom-made discount rate that really captures the bond's unique risk profile. So it's going beyond just credit risk, right? It's factoring in things like liquidity risk, optionality, all those things that could mess with the bond's price. Exactly. It's especially useful for bonds with those embedded options because those can really throw off the traditional yield to maturity calculation. Now, I remember hearing a lot about TED spreads back during the 2008 financial crisis. What were those measuring again? The TED spread, that's the difference between the three-month LIBOR rate, what banks charge each other for short-term loans, and the three-month treasury bill rate. It's a classic way to measure stress in the banking system. So if that spread gets wider, it means banks are getting nervous about lending to each other, not trusting each other as much. That's right. It's like a financial stress test. And back in 08, well, that spread just blew out, showing how much fear there was in the market. It's wild how these spreads can be like a real-time gauge of how the market's feeling, how much risk it's willing to take. They're definitely worth keeping an eye on. They can tip you off to problems that might be brewing under the surface. You know, before LIBOR got phased out, there was another spread we used to watch, the LIBOR way spread. Right. That was the difference between LIBOR and the overnight index swap rate. But since LIBOR is gone, there's something new we track, right? You bet. Now we watch the SCOFO way spread, which looks at the difference between the secured overnight financing rate, or SOFR, and that OIS rate. SOFR is like the new benchmark for risk-free rates in the U.S. And the SOFO has spread. It's really sensitive to what's going on in the U.S. Treasury repurpose market, that repo market, because SOFR is based on what happens there. Exactly. So it's become a key way to measure liquidity and how much risk aversion there is in that really important part of the financial system. If you see that spread getting wider, 
well, it could be a sign of trouble. It seems like we've got this whole toolbox of spreads now, each one giving us a slightly different view of what's going on in the market, helping us interpret what those interest rates are really trying to tell us. That's a great way to think about it. It's all about connecting the dots between these technical indicators and the big picture of how the market's behaving. Now, to really wrap our heads around this, we need to understand the theories that explain why the yield curve looks the way it does in the first place. I mean, it can't just be random, right? You're absolutely right. There's more to it than that. There are a few key theories that try to explain why the yield curve takes on the different shapes we see. One of the classic ones is the unbiased expectations theory. Right. And that one says that those forward rates we talked about, they're basically unbiased predictors of future spot rates. Exactly. So the current shape of the yield curve is reflecting what the market as a whole thinks is going to happen with interest rates. If it's upward sloping, well, the market thinks rates are going up, downward sloping. They think rates are heading down. Makes sense. But doesn't that assume that everyone's perfectly rational and just wants to maximize their returns? I mean, is that really how the world works? That's a good point. Not everyone thinks the same way, right? In reality, people have different appetites for risk. Some might want a higher return just for holding on to their bonds for longer, regardless of what they think rates will do. Which brings us to the liquidity preference theory, right? That one says investors prefer those shorter term, more liquid investments and need a little extra incentive to hold on to bonds for the long haul. You got it. They want that liquidity premium. So even if everyone thought rates were going to stay flat, you'd still see a slightly upward sloping yield curve because of that preference for liquidity. And then there's that segmented markets theory, which is a whole different approach, right? It's all about supply and demand within each specific maturity. That's the one. This theory argues that what really determines yield is the balance of buyers and sellers for each maturity, regardless of what's happening elsewhere on the curve. It's all about those specific forces of supply and demand. So let's say there's a sudden surge in demand for 10-year bonds. Those yields could fall even if everyone thinks rates are going to rise overall. Exactly. That's how powerful those micro-level forces can be. And lastly, we have the preferred habitat theory, which sounds kind of like a compromise between those last two theories. This one says that investors have their favorite maturity ranges, their habitats, as we call it, but they might stray from those if the yields are tempting enough. It's a bit more nuanced. So it's saying that both expectations and supply and demand matter when it comes to the yield curve. It's a more realistic picture of how investors actually behave. Right. It acknowledges that the market isn't one big blob. It's made up of all sorts of players, each with their own goals and limitations, all interacting to create that yield curve we see. It's like we're peeling back the layers of the onion, getting a better understanding of how the market really works. And now we're moving from those big picture theories to something that sounds even more complex yield curve factor models. What are those all about? So we've talked about all these theories about what shapes the yield curve, but now it's time to talk about those models, right? Those yield curve factor models you mentioned, they sound pretty intense, like something you'd only see in a quant textbook. Haha. Ha. Yeah, they can get pretty complicated, but they're really helpful for understanding and managing risk when it comes to interest rates. Basically, they take all those complex movements of the yield curve and break them down into just a few key factors. So instead of trying to analyze every little wiggle on the curve, we can focus on those main drivers. Exactly. One of the most popular models is the Litterman and Scheichmann three-factor model. It identifies the three main things that make the yield curve change level steepness and curvature. Okay, so if I picture the yield curve as a line... I guess the level factor would be those parallel shifts up or down, like the whole curve moving higher or lower together. That's it. And steepness. Well, that's all about changes in the slope of the line. Is it getting steeper so longer term rates are increased the faster than short term rates? Or is it flattening it? And curvature would be those twists and bends in the line, like when short term and long term rates move one way, but those in between rates go the other way. You got it. And the cool thing is you can actually figure out these factors from historical data by looking at how interest rates at different maturities have moved together in the past. So we can use that historical data to figure out those relationships and then try to understand how the curve might react to different events in the future. That's exactly what these models let us do. They give us a way to analyze and even try to predict how the yield curve will behave. And that's super important for managing risk and making smart investment choices. It makes you realize that managing a bond portfolio is way more than just picking the right bonds. It's about understanding all these bigger dynamics of the yield curve and how different parts of it might move in different situations. Absolutely. And that actually brings us to another really important concept that people often forget about the maturity structure of yield volatilities. You see interest rate volatility, it's not the same across the whole curve. Right. I kind of remember learning that short-term rates tend to be more volatile than those longer-term ones, but why is that? Well, think about what drives those short-term rates. Central banks, they often target short-term rates with their monetary policy. So those rates are naturally going to be more sensitive to things like policy decisions, and other economic shocks. That makes sense. So long-term rates are more influenced by bigger picture things like what people expect inflation to be and the long-term growth outlook. And 
those things tend to be more stable over time. Exactly. And this whole pattern of how volatility changes across maturities, well, we can actually measure that with something called the volatility term structure. So it's like another curve, right? But this one shows the expected volatility for different maturities, like a yield curve, but for volatility. Exactly. And by understanding this volatility term structure, we can get a better handle on how different parts of that yield curve might react to changes in the market. This is all great stuff for anyone studying for the CFA Level 2 exam. It takes those basic ideas of spot rates and yield curves and adds a whole new layer of understanding. Yeah, it's about going beyond just knowing the definitions and really getting how these concepts actually work together out in the real world, how volatility changes across the curve, what drives those changes, and how you can use that knowledge to manage risk the right way. Before we wrap up this amazing deep dive, I think we need to take a step back and look at those big economic forces that are driving interest rates in the first place. I mean, we've talked about market expectations and risk but it can't be just that, right? Absolutely not. Those market forces are influenced by a whole bunch of macroeconomic factors, things like inflation, economic growth, and monetary policy. They all have a say in what happens with interest rates. Okay, so let's break it down. Inflation seems pretty straightforward when prices are rising. Fast investors want higher interest rates to protect their purchasing power. Exactly. High inflation eats away at the value of those future cash flows. So lenders want a bigger return to make up for that risk. And what about economic growth? How does that play into things? Well, strong economic growth usually means more demand for credit because businesses are borrowing more to invest and expand, and that increased demand can push interest rates higher. So it's a good sign that the economy is doing well, but if that growth gets out of control, it can actually lead to even higher inflation and even higher rates down the line. It's a bit of a balancing act. You got it. And that's where monetary policy comes in central banks like the Fed in the U.S., they can influence rates by adjusting how much money is out there and setting those benchmark rates. So if they want to boost the economy, they can lower rates to encourage borrowing and spending. But if they're worried about inflation, they can raise rates to try to cool things down. Exactly. It's a powerful tool they have. But it's not all about the central banks, right? Governments and their fiscal policies can also affect interest rates. Absolutely. If a government borrows a lot of money to fund their spending, that can drive rates up because there's more supply of bonds out there. And on the flip side, if a government suddenly says, hey, we're not going to issue any more 30-year bonds because we think they'll have budget surpluses, well, that could cause those long-term rates to fall. Exactly. Supply and demand at work again. And speaking of demands, we can't forget about investors, domestic investors, like those big pension funds and insurance companies. They love those long-dated bonds because they match up with their long-term obligations. Right. Their demand can really push down yield on those longer maturities, which changes the shape of the yield curve. And then you've got those foreign investors who can move huge amounts of money in and out of countries. Their decisions can have a big impact on bond prices and yields, especially in those emerging markets. And don't forget about those times when things get really uncertain globally. Everyone rushes to those safe haven assets like U.S. Treasuries driving down those yields. It's like a flight to quality. Yeah, those events can really flatten the yield curve because safety becomes more important than returns. It's incredible to see how all these factors, inflation growth, monetary policy, fiscal policy, investor, demand, the global events, they all come together to create this dynamic and constantly changing landscape for interest rates. It's a complicated system, but if you understand those key drivers, you can start to make sense of why interest rates move the way they do and how they might affect your investments. This has been an amazing journey exploring the world of interest rates and the term structure. I feel like I've learned so much and I'm sure our listeners have too. It's been a pleasure talking about this with, you remember, this knowledge isn't just about passing an exam. It's about getting a deeper understanding of how markets work and how to use that to make smarter decisions. I couldn't agree more so as we wrap up this episode. Let's leave our listeners with something to think about. Given everything we've discussed, what do you think about the future of interest rates? Will the yield curve steepen or flatten in the coming months? And what strategies would you consider based on what you think will happen? That's a great question to ponder. It really forces us to use everything we've learned today to try to make sense of what's happening in the market right now and what might be coming next. Thanks for joining us at this deep dive into the term structure of interest rates. Until next time, keep learning, keep exploring, and keep pushing your financial knowledge further.